The government authorizes on an exceptional and temporary basis the import by passengers in their luggage of food, hygiene products and medicines with no limits on value and without customs duties. All right. Well, Anthony Capcha, Emeritus Professor in the Center for Research on Cuba at the University of Nottingham, joins us now. Professor, the instigator for these demonstrations in Cuba were food shortages and high prices. So why were we seeing that now? We're seeing it now because there's a combination, a, a conjunction of three pressures. The most obvious one, and you can never, ever forget it, is the impact of the embargo which was tightened more than any other pre U.S. president uh, since 1963, tightened by Trump, and has not been eased on Biden. So those measures under the embargo are really and have been constricting the economy much more than any um, in any period before this. That's the first pressure. The second, of course, is COVID. And the Cuba reaction to COVID was very efficient and very rapid, but it meant cutting the main source of income, which is tourism, because the only way to stop COVID spreading was to stop the tourist arrivals. Without tourism, the Cuban economy actually doesn't function properly. So you put those two figures together, plus one other thing, which is that they at long last it decided in January to fuse the two, two currencies. Any visitor to Cuba knows how difficult and com incomprehensible the dual currency system was. It was an emergency measure in the 1990s during the crisis then, um, but no one has actually been able to untangle that web. Well, Diaz-Canel did that in January, but there's a cost because like any fusion or change in the currency, there are winners and losers. And so many of those protesting may well be people directly affected by effectively the end of the dollar-based economy, the hard currency-based um, economy. So those three have come together and made a particular crisis right now. You know, it's extremely rare to see protests like this in Cuba. Why is that? Mostly because there hasn't been a great deal of reason to do to protest. There have been big protests, very big ones, in 1980, long ago. 1994 was a far bigger protest than the one we're seeing at the moment, far bigger and far more worrying for the system. And interestingly, in both cases, one way of eventually easing the tension was to allow greater emigration. Um, there were two massive emigrations immediately afterwards. Well, that option isn't right isn't available right now because the United States has basically locked the door on the Cubans. By closing the embassy, effectively, it's not officially closed, but it's not functioning. And by restricting migrants who had the automatic right of citizenship or residency leading to citizenship if they arrived in the United States, that's gone. So that option of migration, emigration, has taken away a potential safety valve. Therefore, protest is going to be greater right now than it has been in the past. Although, in practice, we're, although we're seeing a lot of protest and where the media are picking it up, it is mostly concentrated in one or two areas of one or two cities. The majority of the island is unaffected by it at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about how sanctions have not been eased under Biden, and we have seen kind of a back and forth over the last few presidential administrations from Obama's push to ease some sanctions on Cuba to Trump tightening them again. How do you think the Biden administration will proceed um, with its policy toward Cuba? It seems to, at the moment, being somewhere between Obama and Trump. It's not restored the uh, relations that existed under Obama. Obama, of course, didn't lift the embargo and couldn't. He made small changes to it, but even then, most of those changes were not enacted. So the, it was the mood music that changed rather than the concrete detail. Um, and Biden shows no interest at the moment, I think, in going back to anything like even the Clinton years where relations improved, where there was a, the fraying around the edges of the embargo. It seems to be as tight as ever. And he has now also made uh, any change. For example, he's offered humanitarian aid, but conditional humanitarian aid, only if the Cubans allow certain measures determined by the United States. So, of course, it's been rejected in Cuba, as you might expect. 
So do you think following these recent protests that people will feel emboldened and we could potentially see more unrest on the island? I think they were already emboldened, actually, already by the um, disappearance of Raul Castro from the leadership of the, of the Communist Party. Um, it's interesting that the protests suddenly emerged almost exactly the point where Diaz-Canel became president, and when particular he uh, started to pass the reforms, the crucial reforms, like the currency reform and a constitution, that eased up the possibility in the eyes of many of the the dissident population, the dissident sector, who then became much more vociferous, uh, knowing perhaps that the United States would once again support them. And indeed, there is a clear link between the organizers of some of the protests and organizations based in the United States. And the media, one of the things, the access to the internet, which has increased vastly in Cuba in the last five years, of course, also increases the access to the internet connections for Cubans from United States uh, sources. So there is a big, big change there. Mm, all right, we'll leave it there. Anthony Kepcha joining us from London. Thank you.